Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Paris Air Show at the historic Le Bourget Airfield outside the French capital. Our coverage here is sponsored by L3 Technologies and Leonardo DRS. And we've got with us Leanne Corrette, who's the president and CEO of Boeing Defense, Space and Security. Leanne, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me today. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure, and full disclosure, Boeing is uh, also one of our sponsors. Um, I want to start off, you guys had a big management announcement that you made last week. Um, it's more, it's sort of bigger news in part because it's part of your continuing drive to increase agility, and as you've put it, um, taking that layer of management out, and it was it was uh, a little under 60 executives that uh, w are either going to be a, a through attrition or move to different jobs. Uh, but you said that this is a key drive to winning, that right. just to start winning. Uh, and you guys do win your fair share of contracts. I mean, you're the world's largest aerospace and defense contractor. But I want to ask you first, you know, do you know exactly why you're not winning? You know, is it because of your proposals? Is it affordability? You know, have you gotten to the heart of what you think the challenge are? You know, B-21 was, was a stinging loss uh, for you guys. You were very proud of what you had done on that program. Uh, and, and you, you know, Northrop ended up besting you on it. You know, do you know what the, what the problem is that you're necessarily trying to fix with this decision or, or the, these set of actions? Well, you know, it wasn't any single loss. When I stepped into the role about a year and a half ago, it was about how could we be our very best as we went into our second century. And it was focused on how well are we listening to our customer? Are we affordable? Because this is a really competitive environment, as you know. And are we responsive to our customers, not only in uh, time in terms of delivering results, uh, but also in terms of keeping up with technology. And so it was a three-pronged approach. The first focus purely at affordability was our site consolidation we announced last November. And at, for we did what we did is we literally put right work at the right place, and we are in the process of um, closing down some sites and then expanding work presence in other locations because we have that right talent there um, and it's the, it's the right place to be for the type of work we're executing. The second part was all about the customer. I announced at the end of the year that beginning at the uh, prior, at beginning of 2017, we would have headquarters in Washington, D.C. This is about being in the customer's backyard, being a part of the community that they live and work in every day, being a part of the fabric of their lives. I want us to be active listeners. I want us to be proactive in terms of anticipating their needs, and I want to make it easier for them to do business with us. And then third was about being more agile. And the best way you can do uh, be agile is to do things quicker, um, be more decisive. And so we've literally uh, streamlined the organization. I elevated uh, several of the divisions up to be direct reports. Um, and then we literally took a layer of executive leadership out. Uh, we all know that we can get really, uh, any of us in any company in any industry can get really uh, bogged down in terms of the time to get uh, things done internally. When you take out uh, that layer, you're gonna help speed that up. And as you know, time is money. When, how will you know that you've, how and what has to happen for you to know that you're succeeding? What's the metric that you're looking at that will indicate success to you? Winning. I, and let me expand on that. We had an incredible 2016. We literally extended every one of our production lines in Boeing Defense. Never been done before. And it's given us an incredible core from which to operate. But going back to uh, that win, we've had a number of elusive big franchi franchise wins. Uh, you mentioned LRS being one of those. Uh, I don't want them to be so elusive going forward. And so this is about um, winning that next franchise. And right now your must wins are TX that you put into that category, ground-based uh, strategic deterrent, which is the ICBM replacement. That's a major competition that's ongoing, as well as the Joint Stars uh, replacement. Various uh, teams are pursuing that uh, as, as well. What are some of the ideas, techniques. I mean, you guys tried something on B-21, which was which was very extensive, uh, going down to producibility, the Black Diamond Initiative. There were a whole bunch of things that you were trying to put into that program in order to, uh, you know, some of it experimental, some of it process control, some of it actual serious investment in technology. Um, what are the things that, you know, are, are you comfortable with all of the things you guys are doing on those programs to increase your win probability? Well, first, you know, I like to call these can wins because, as you know, you and I have had this conversation. There's not going to be any one single program that defines uh, the future of Boeing Defense, but these are all opportunities for us to just take it to the next level. 
I do believe we're investing uh, the right way in terms of our technology. I believe that we're attacking those things to make us more affordable. And I think we have uh, really accelerated our focus on the customer. Those are all things that are going to advantage us. But as you know, these are all price uh, shootouts. And we have a number of large franchise programs in front of us where we need to deliver the right capability at the right price, at the right time. And that's what we're focused on. One of your competitors in looking at the TX competition said, tremendous airplane. It's a really, really great airplane. And thankfully, they were a little bit late with it, that it took them a little bit too long to get to market. And I can sort of understand that. One of the airplanes has been in service in 10 years, has international orders. The other one has been in service roughly the same amount of time, right? I mean, the, 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 both the T1, the 346 and then the, the T50, uh, you know, the T50 uh, that's, that's out there. You know, it, is, is that, you know, how do you respond to that? And, and is that part of the agility you're trying to solve to pull decisions like that perhaps a little bit earlier uh, in the process as opposed to, to arriving the way that it has a little bit perhaps later in the process than, than folks might have liked? Well, you know, I'm not going to respond uh, to their opinion. I think it's interesting. What I find even more interesting is I have two aircraft that are flying incredibly well. Uh, from concept to first flight, we were up in 36 months. Uh, they fly as good as they look. They fly like the U.S. Air Force trains, and I'm looking forward to the competition. Uh, are you? How confident are you? I'm always looking forward to the competition. In your recent announcement, I mean, there were two things that would remain unchanged, and I want to get your take as to how long they're going to remain unchanged, and that's your development team, mm -hmm. as well as Phantom Works, that have been key parts of your, uh, your proposal win uh, drive. It's part of the structure. It's part of the process that you guys have. How much longer is that going to stay? Are they going to remain unchanged? Well, I can't predict the future, but it was very, it was, I made a very conscious decision that we set up development organizations specifically to ensure we have consistent and systematic approach to how we execute our development programs. I think we're doing that. We have seen uh, great strides as we move forward, albeit some of uh, the programs haven't received benefit for it because they started prior to this organization being set up. But it was purposeful, and right now it's working for us. Uh, same with Phantom Works. I mean, uh, Phantom Works supports uh, um, the aspects of pre-EMD across our entire portfolio from sea to space. And I can the value we get from that is continues, continues to be seen, and we leverage that across the entire organization. So for right now, I'm feeling um, extremely optimistic about the structure that we've laid out. Uh, and we'll just continue to move forward with it as time progresses. Let me ask you a couple of programmatic questions. KC-46, uh, another delay on that program. Um, you guys are absorbing all the costs on it, which, which can't be uh, easy. Um, you know, was there at all an original sin in that program or some initial problems or errors that were made that are being paid for over time? Because this was something that everybody sort of intuitively thought should be relatively an easy thing. 767 was a, you know, legacy airplane in service for a long time. You'd been looking at this program for a long time. A uh, couple of bites at the apple to get to where we are uh, now to this iteration, uh, iteration of the aircraft. You know, what, uh, do, do, do you guys understand like what some of these challenges are and why they're coming up to be able to sort of start getting ahead of them as opposed to, you know, c continuing to, to, uh, to experience them? And, and the reason I ask that is that some folks look at the strategy of the company for derivatives of these commercial aircraft and some folks point to this and say, well, look, you know, this should be an easy thing to happen, not sort of a complicated thing to happen. Well, I'll first start off on the comment on KC-46. I, I think a lot of what people are talking about is the schedule risk assessment that was just published by the U.S. Air Force that Boeing participated in. Uh, their finding was, ex um, in to uh, was totally correct and appropriate, which is if Boeing cannot manage the risks that have been identified, by which we agree on those risks, then a year-end delivery could be impacted. As I've shared with everybody, and the Air Force un, um, agrees, it's Boeing's job to manage those risks, and that's what our team is focused on. So I'm looking forward uh, to delivering our first tanker uh, this year, and of course we'll work with the customer as we continue moving forward. To your point, Boeing has stood by this program uh, from the beginning. It is a franchise that we're extremely proud of winning. It is something that's going to provide long-term value both for the customer as well as for our shareholders, um, and it is going to be a a wonderful, brilliant, combat-ready tanker uh, for the services to be able to use as soon as they start fielding them. 
And and uh, we we had the honor of visiting uh, the first aircraft when when it was uh, in in final integration. So we're we're looking forward to someday riding on it and and being able to interview you or uh, the program folks while we're, we're while we're on the jet. But let me take you. Are there any lessons learned as you're pursuing Joint Stars and so many other programs? What are some of the lessons that you're learning, for example, from Tanker that you're applying to these other programs to make sure that they, they go more smoothly, perhaps, than this program has? You know, Vago, as you and I have spoken before, we're gathering lessons learned across the board. And I think you see it across a multitude of uh, development programs, not just within Boeing, but across the industry. Uh, we've had some a really good fortune to have such a great partnership with the u.s air force but this is about making certain from day one we're managing to the system's requirements we have good functional flow downs we're managing change at every level of the organization not just external change but internal change and that we continue to work together with a with a focus on delivering uh the the product at the time that we've committed. My number one objective for our customers is to deliver on our promises, and that's why uh, Tanker is a, such a, is so important to all of us. Let me take you to where you guys are expanding your business. If you go way back, Boeing was involved in naval programs, uh, whether through hydrofoils or other uh, types of programs, but then you guys sort of got out of that space, and now you're in a very big way, particularly in undersea. You have the liquid robotics part of the business, which does something very unique in sort of this digital ocean initiative uh, that uh, Admiral Gallaudet has and, and uh, uh, the oceanographer of the Navy's office, I should say, has. Talk to us a little bit about how important the undersea business is, and what are some interesting novel areas where you want to expand the Boeing footprint? Well, you know, I first have to share with you why I'm smiling. Very few people ever mention hydrofoils to me, but my my dad worked on the Boeing hydrofoil program, and that we were living up in Seattle when that was ongoing. So that is just, it's not very many people talk about it, so I had to share. Well, I have to say, I think it was one of the coolest warships ever, ever, with a three-inch gun up front and a hydrofoil that can go that fast. But anyway, we digress. I don't get out much, as people know. <laughs> No, but when you speak about our Echo Voyager and our under, autonomous underwater vehicles, that's where we're taking the art of autonomy from seabed to space. The technology and the aspects we use as we manage our satellite programs and some of our human space exploration programs have direct correlation to the technologies uh, that we're using um, undersea. And so it's just a matter of taking it to that next level. Um, when we think about why uh, we are moved, we purchase liquid robotics and others. It's a great man-on-man uh, -man teaming concept to where we can truly provide ISR and other types of um, capabilities for these customer sets as their needs continue to evolve. On the budget, when you and I spoke at the Reagan Forum, there was optimism that the budget profile would look good. As the CEO of one of the world's largest defense companies, where do you see the budget profile going in the United States and internationally, and where are you going to be moving the company to take advantage of those increases? Well, my position has hasn't changed much uh, since when we spoke last. You know, I'm not expecting a big hockey stick where all of a sudden, you know, we're going to see some sort of an exponential change in defense spending. I'm very pragmatic, as you know. Um, I think we're seeing modest growth. Um, I think you're seeing that um, the capabilities and the products that we provide are resonating well around the world, and we're going to continue to focus on providing that to them as soon as we can. And F-18, are you confident the future of that program is going to be bright in the next year to bridge you over in production between the U.S. orders and the Middle Eastern ones? Yes. Thanks, Vago. Leanne, thanks very much. Great to see you.